Okay. I want to help you guys with the central limit theorem. And some of you uh, using Newton, you might see a Z table that you're not used to if you're using the graphing calculator to do all your percentages under a normal distribution curve, like normal CDF or inverse norm. When you get, and I'm just, let me shut my phone off. When you get to the central limit theorem, um, there's some things you have to understand to understand the terminology. So, you know, it is good to do some research on what it is. I'm gonna just it as fast as I can, but there are a couple things that I wanna tell you before I get to that um, and before I get to an example. So first thing is, you guys know that when you have a normal distribution curve, you know that the mean can vary. And we talked about this, the center is the mean. We, we looked at this situation, right? One standard deviation above the mean is mu plus sigma, and you can keep going from there. And then the standard normal distribution curve is a special curve, which is also normal, SND. But particularly for this curve, the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one, the center of this curve is zero, and the values on the horizontal scale are z-scores. And we talked about that. So z-scores, right? So anytime you talk about z-scores, you're automatically talking about your, uh, your standard normal distribution curve. Now, I mean, you have a formula that can convert any data value from a regular normal distribution to the standard. This formula here, you take the, the data value, you subtract the mean, and you divide by the standard deviation. Now, when you're finding area under the curve, what we do is we use normal CDF. If you don't have that option, if you don't have a graphing calculator, if you don't have you know um, statistical like applications on your computer, if you don't have the programs that will do this for you, you have to use that table, the z-score table. The z-score table, and there's different variations of it, gives you the area under the curve for the corresponding z-score. So if you're using the table to find percentage, what you have to do is take your normal distribution situation, convert it into the standard, so find the corresponding z-score, then go to the table and figure out what your z-score is, and then determine the area from there. That's, an, you know, that that's, it's doable, it's how we used to do it, right? But at the end of the day, if you have your graph and calculator, it does all that for you when you do normal CDF. You don't have to go through that process. So you can actually get rid of this table if you're using your TI-84, TI-83, which is what we do, you know, um, at least, you know, with uh, with with our school, right? So um, they have that there if you don't have the other option, right? If you want to do it that way. And, and not saying it's a bad way, it's just um, cumbersome, right? A little extra work. And if you want to see an example of that, we could do that as well. But I'm sure a lot of you want to get to the point. So the, the table is there because it says, use the results from the above, blah, blah, blah. You may use a calculator or the portion of the Z table given below. So they're giving you a Z table, which gives you area corresponding to a Z score. But in order to use that table, you have to convert it to the standard normal distribution curve first. You have like two extra steps rather than just going to normal CDF. So that's what that table is. You don't have to use it, okay? You don't have to, or you have your graphing calculator, you don't have to use the table. So you can almost ignore it. If you wanna learn how to use the table, that's fine too. That's a separate thing, okay? Um, now, central limit theorem. I used this guy's video uh, and, and his link is here. I kind of took pieces from his video because I like the way that he visualizes it or shows you how a distribution can change when you collect more samples. So before I even talk about this, um, well, maybe I'll talk about this first. If all samples of size n are taken from a population of size large n, capital N is population size, small n is sample size, with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, the distribution of sample of mean will be approximately normal. I think it's a terminology also that's funky, right? The distribution of sample of means. Let me tell you what that means in, um, in a second. Approximately normal. The distribution of sample means is always normal if the population is normal. That is true. Distribution of sample means can be assumed to be normal if n is greater than or equal to 30 and the sample is taken from a large population. These are the requirements 
that the central limit theorem states, if you have a non-normal distribution and you want to use normal methods like normal CDF and inverse norm, those correspond, normal CDF and inverse norm, you have to have a normally distributed situation to use that. What happens if your distribution is not initially normal? The central limit theorem says, yeah, we can get around that if these conditions are met. Either the distribution of the sample means is normal, um, I'm sorry, or if the original population is normal, or if the sample size is greater than or equal to 30. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about what this guy talks about in his video um, and why I love the visual that he gives. So... He shows a population. So let's say the population, um, I don't know, whatever samples, whatever the, whatever the size of the population is, he has a population. He takes the average of, of, you know, one sample of the population, let's say. And so here's my first situation. He has a histogram represent the av representing the average or the mean value of that particular sample that he took. Okay, obviously not normally distributed, right? <clears throat> he collects... 10 more samples, so he has 10 more samples, and then calculates the average of each of those samples. So each of these red lines has their own little average, and then puts the averages on a distribution, and that distribution of the averages is approaching a normal distribution, is getting closer, right, to a normally kind of situation, symmetric. This one only has 10 samples. Let's do the next one. Here's the histogram after collecting 20 samples. Now he collects 20 samples from the population, 20 samples from the population. Each of those samples gets a mean. So he has 20 means now, and then he makes a distribution of the means or a histogram of the means. And look at that, the histogram is getting closer to normal, right? It's getting closer to that symmetric kind of bell-shaped curve. But this is only 20 means. Let's see what happens if he takes 30 means. So now he has 30 samples from the original population. And each of those samples gets a mean calculated for that sample. And then he makes a histogram or a distribution of those samples, of those means. So this is a distribution of the means. This is a histogram of the averages of these samples. And look at how it's getting more normal. It's approaching a normal distribution. This is 30, right? You see, as you get more, as we get larger than 30, we approach more and more symmetric bell-shaped type of curve. This is a situation after 40 means. So he has now 40 samples, all these red things, 40 samples. Each of these red things represents a different sample from the population. Each of these red things has an average calculated for each of them. Makes a histogram of those means which is a distribution of those means, which is getting closer to symmetric and bell-shaped. He keeps doing that. That's why I like that video, because he shows 50 means, 60 means, 70 means. I jumped to 100, so look at 100 means. Now he takes 100 samples from the population. Each of those samples gets an average. So now he has 100 averages, 100 means, does a histogram of those means, which you can see now we're approaching, that's an ugly, but <laughs> we're approaching a normal distribution curve. But this is called the distribution of the means. It's a distribution or a histogram of the means of these samples. That's why it says 100 means. That's why this terminology is funky, right? Um, where is it? Where is it? Where? The distribution of the sample means. That's what this notation means. So as you can see, as we get more, a larger sample, as n approaches and gets larger, approaches a, get well, bigger than 30, according to the central limit theorem, 30 is that magic number, then we can use our normal distribution methods. <clears throat> and because the distribution of the means is normal, we're allowed to use our methods for that original population, excuse me, original population. But you have this new notation. You see that? Mu x bar. This is the mean of the distribution of sample means. 
of the, I'm just going to say distribution of sample means. It's like the mean of the sample means. What does that mean? <laughs> Remember that I'm using the word mean to represent average, right? So if I have, let's say, for example, here, if I take the average of these 100 means, according to this, it should be the same as the population mean. So this is equal to mu, that's what this means, okay? Because now remember, I'm using this distribution to approximate my stuff. I'm using the, the distribution of the means. I'm using the distribution of the sample means. I'm using this histogram of these means. Remember, I took 100 samples, found the average of each sample, put it on a histogram, and that's what this is. So because I'm using this to determine percentage, I have to now look at the the mean and the standard deviation of this, right? So now I have the sigma x bar, which is the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means, which is not the same as the original population standard deviation, is found by taking that and dividing by the square root of n, which we also call the standard error. So that's why, um, sloppy here. That's why when you start the central limit theorem, they start by asking you, what is the mean of the distribution of sample means? What is the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means? Or they ask you for these notation because now you're looking at that distribution to represent your population. So the mean is not gonna change, the mean of this is not gonna change from the original population mean, but the standard deviation is different. You have to calculate the standard error first. So that's what this means. If all samples of size N, if a bunch of samples of a specific size N, they all have to be the same sample size, are taken from a population, and the population has a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, and we take the averages of each of those samples, and then we make a distribution of those averages, it approaches um, it approaches a normal distribution type of symmetric situation if the samples are greater than 30, greater than or equal to 30, or the original population is normal, these two conditions. So then we can now use um, our normal approximations. So that's the background before I even do the problem. And like I said, I know the notation is funky and the terminology is funky. Now this one kind of has it done a bit for us. What I'm gonna do is now, because I said, you know, I almost said a bad word. <laughs> because I said, forget this table, I'm gonna ignore it because you don't need it unless you have to go through the process of converting to a standard normal situation first. But we don't have to do that. We have our graphing calculator. Now let's see this. I might add to this as well, just for practice, okay? So <clears throat> the population, now, I mean, th this is nice of them that they gave us everything in notation, but I'm gonna assume that they didn't and write it myself as well. The population has a mean. Population mean mu. Population, the original population has a mean of 36. The standard deviation of the population is 11. Now, I don't have the distribution, it doesn't matter. Let's assume that it's non-normal, right? The distribution is non-normal, and I want to determine, you know, percentage or probability or whatever. Um, we are asked for the mean and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for a sample of size 45. Now, even if they didn't tell me I'm using the central limit theorem, Typically, when you're given a mean and a standard deviation and then a sample size, and you're talking about percentage and such, you are definitely going into the central limit theorem. Um, they gave us this. Uh, too easy. I should take that off, right? Um, assume they don't give you that. You got to convert it yourself. They gave me the population mean, 36, which is mu, the population standard deviation, which is sigma, which is 11 for this situation, a sample size of 45. What I wanna verify 
because if I want to use the central limit theorem, I have to verify that the original population is normal or that n is greater than or equal to 30. They don't tell me anything about the original population being normal, so I have to verify that n is greater than or equal to 30, which it is, which is probably going to be the situation if they want you to do something after that, right? Um, but because I have to use the central limit theorem, now I'm going to go and find the mean of the distribution of the sample means, right? The mean of the distribution of the sample mean, which is the same as the original mean. And I need the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means, which is not the same. This is the only thing that kind of changes. We calculate what we call the standard error. And again, assuming that they don't give me this, I have to calculate this, but I have everything I need. So sigma is 11, square root of 45 on the bottom. And I'm gonna take a lot of digits because I'm gonna use this for other calculations. So let me show you, I have 11 divided by the square root of 45. I'm gonna take a whole bunch of these because I need to use this to calculate other things. If I round too much now, I will get more error in my final conclusion. So. 1.639783, I'm just gonna say two. If this is all they ask me for, round how they tell you to round. If I'm continuing to calculate something, which I am, probability, then I want to take a lot of these. So your notation is this, instead of X, it's X bar. This is the, um, the, this, the stand, what do you call it, the sample mean, right, mean of the samples, right, which is, remember I did this notation in my webinar, normally distributed, where the mean is this, and the standard deviation is this. You can actually write it also as this, and this is going to be the same, but this is going to change. If you know this, then you could do anything. This is really all it's about. Because now if I want probability, I'm gonna draw this curve because now we're allowed to use normal distribution approximations. The center of this is the mean, which is 36. And I want to find, <clears throat> I'm gonna type this up. I'm gonna type this up because I'm gonna do a few examples. What is the probability that the sample uh, mean for a sample size of 45 will be less than 34.5. I'm going to do more than what this says, OK? Uh, this is just what they asked me. I'm probably going to do another example. That's why I wanted to type it up, because I'm going to do a couple of examples here because I think that'll help, right? It's all about seeing it done, seeing the example to help you understand the process, right? So we got this. Okay, that's the first one. We'll do with the second one in a second. Let's deal with the first one first, okay? Okay, I want, this is going to, um, you know, what I did also in my webinar, but what is the probability? So if I want probability and I'm dealing with normal distribution situations, I want area, right? Which indicates, if you guys remember, that I would use normal CDF. Now I just have to figure out where my lower bound, upper bound. For So <clears throat> what is the probability that the sample mean for a sample size up? This is, you see this extra verbiage, which is, all this extra verbiage is just saying that you went through this process of the central limit theorem. You determined that you can use your normal distribution approximations, but you're now here on a distribution of the sample, distribution of these sample means, right? This is the distribution of these means on a histogram. That's what that is saying. Um, will be less than 34.5, and that's, so 34.5 is approximately here-ish, and I want less than, which means I should be talking about the area to the left of that area, normal CDF. 
lower bound, which I hope you guys, you guys can either use the one E99, I don't need that many nines, um, a large negative number, if you want to put it like that, or this negative one E99, I'll show you in a second. My upper bound is 34.5. My mean is whatever the mean is here, which is the same. <laughs> My standard deviation is this guy. This is the big deal because if you don't use the standard deviation of the of the uh, distribution of sample means or the standard error, then you're going to get error in your final conclusion. But this is also why I took a whole bunch of digits here because I'm going to use that value down here, one point six three, whatever, one point six three nine seven eight three two. Okay, it's not extremely different from what you did. It's just that obviously there's a couple more things to understand or literally find the standard error before you do your normal CDF. Normal CDF, my lower bound, negative one, if you're not sure how to do this, negative is here next to the enter, negative one, this EE is your like scientific notation, so second here, and then 99, that's a very large negative number. My upper bound is 34.5, my mean is 36, and my standard deviation that I'm putting here and I, you know what, you might even be able to put the 11 divided by the square root of 45 here as well. If you want more accuracy in your final, let me see if it gives me this issue. No, it doesn't. You can even put that whole thing in there and it'll calculate everything more accurately as well too. And here is my answer, 0 0.1802, and depending on how you're asked to round. Let's see. Let's do another one. Well, what is the probability that the sample mean for a sample size of 45 will be between um, um, 37 and 38.2? Okay. Oops. Let's do this one. Okay. If I'm a visual person, I'm going to draw it. I'm allowed to draw a normal distribution curve because of the fact that I went through the central limit theorem and I did what I had to do. And the center of this is 36. I want probability, which means I want area, which means I'm gonna use normal CDF. I just have to figure out like where, but I want, um, and, and like I said, you see this extra verbiage. What is the probability that the sample mean for a sample size? All that's doing is saying yeah, you're using the central limit theorem. All the requirements are met, everything is good. Now you can actually do the rest. Um, will be between 37 and 38.2. So 37 is approximately here. 38.2 is bigger than that. I want between, which means I want this area in between. We already said if we want area, we go normal CDF. Normal CDF is found. Second bars, normal CDF. My lower is the 37. My upper is the 38.2. The mean is the mean of the uh, distribution of sample means. The standard deviation is the standard devi uh, where is it? The standard deviation of the distribution of sample means or the standard error, which you can put this long thing or literally, you see I typed it in here, just be careful how you type it. Maybe I wanna put so 11, I could put 11 divided by the square root of 45 here as well. And then it gives me my answer. Um, 37, he said, 38.2 is the upper bound, 36 is the mean of the sampling distribution. Um, and then you could literally put this here if you want to, to be more accurate. So approximately 0 0.1811, depending on how you want to round. <clears throat> I'm gonna do one more. And just for fun and kicks and giggles, this one is going to be slightly different. Um, let's say we'll just say what value, whatever it might be, what value, um, separates the top ten percent. Um on this situation, okay? On this distribution of the sample means. 
top 10%. So now if you guys, you know, kind of follow the process, the thought process that I do, top 10%, it sounds like I'm given a percentage. So I'm given an area and I want a value. And that tells me that I'm going to use inverse norm now. And I'm a visual person, so I'm going to draw it out. Oops. Um, so let's draw it out. Normally distributed, the center's 36, the same as before. The top, top 10% would be an area in the right tail. And that area is 0 0.10. And again, you guys know that I use you know, when I'm drawing my curve, when I'm talking about area, I always put it on the top in decimal form. My value's on the bottom. This is the value that I'm looking for. Technically, this is an X bar. It's an actual sample mean. But again, remember, I'm on this distribution of sample means, right? Well, not particularly this one, but that idea, right? Um, Inverse norm. Now I'm going to show the two different ways. Some of you, I saw some of you say, like, if I have the option to tell it where the area is, by all means, you don't have to deal with the thought process of, you know, like a TI-83 or whatever. So let's go here. Second bars, inverse norm. You see, I have, I have the option to tell the calculator the location of the area, but not everybody has this option. So I'm going to do it with the option and I'll do it without just because, okay? Um, the area that I am given is 0.10 because it's top 10%. So I'm going to put area of 0 0.10. The mean is 36, the mean of the sampling distribution. Um, and the sigma, actually, I could literally, again, 11 divided by the square root of 45. I could literally just put that in. Now, if you have this option, I have to tell it that my area is in the right tail. And then it will give me what I need. So this is the one where you have the option, 36, 11 over the square root of 45. This is where you have the option to tell it that the area is in the right, which is uh, the value that is given. 38.1, depending on how you're asked around, pay attention to how you're asked around, but that is the value that separates the top 10%. If you don't have that option, then you do have to deal with, you know, telling the calculator what the area to the left is, but I hope that's not a big deal because literally if the total area is, and I'll put this in pink, I guess, if the total area is one, then the area to the left of that is just the complement. The total area has to add up to one. This is if you don't have the option. So inverse norm, you'd have to put the 0.9 or the one minus 36, 11 over the square root of 45. This is if you don't have the option to tell it you want the area to the right, but check it out, watch, 0.9. I'll leave that, leave that. This is if you don't have the option, your calculator automatically assumes area to the left. You get the same thing, okay? You get the same thing, okay? So, you know, like this central limit theorem stuff is not very different than what you've done. However, obviously there's something going on before you're allowed to use the methods, the normal CDF and the inverse norm. Hopefully that helps. Hopefully it makes sense. If you guys have questions, obviously ask questions. Um, otherwise, hopefully that helps. Good luck, okay?